Hey everybody, Gary Adelman, American Battlefield Trust. I'm starting to get tired, man. I don't know if this is 40, 40 or so videos in, but this stuff wears you out. You try screaming at a camera, walking around battlefields on hot days and see what happens. We got Chris White uh, behind the camera here. And you know, as we wrap things up, I really hope you all will go back and look at our Gettysburg 154 coverage. We still needed, you know, a little help technically then. Uh, Facebook wasn't up to the task. And 155, 156, 157. And I'm glad you've been able to join us for Gettysburg 158. And here we are at Williamsport, Maryland. Uh, not Williamsport, Pennsylvania. South Williamsport is, of course, where uh, Little League Hall of Fame and Little League World Series is held. But Williamsport, Maryland, which figures into the very end of the Gettysburg campaign. We're behind Robert E. Lee's sort of left flank, uh, you know, as, as and, and we'll get into that in a second. But what I wanted to talk about before we bring Chris White on is that we are along the CNO Canal. Now, for this is not as long as the Appalachian Trail, but does intersect with it. Not nearly as famous as this or some of the big trails out west, but to anybody who lives along the CNO, such as I do, um, it's a really big deal. The CNO, of course, was a canal conceived in part by George Washington that was going to go all the way out to western Pennsylvania. Um, and there, Chris just got beat up by another brood 10 cicada there, um, in case the camera shook there. And this is a series, of course, of locks and a canal that would allow for transport back and forth from the hinterlands all the way to Georgetown and a little bit beyond. It's about 185 miles long. We're um, maybe two-thirds or not quite two-thirds of the way up it um, at Williamsport. We're, at, we're roughly at mile 100. We're at lock number 44. The series of locks, of course, would flood with water and allow uh, boats to deal, especially when going back up river um, with, uh, you know, the rising waters. Uh, the path next to it originally had mules towing these coal and other goods uh, boats up and down this towpath. Of course, the railroad really destroyed this thing. So now we have it as one of the longest, thinnest national parks that there is. And you can go all the way down to Georgetown at the 0.4 mile uh, marker. You can go to Harper's Ferry, which is where this intersects with the Appalachian Trail around mile number 60. It's a great national park. So, and what it does is of course, parallel the Potomac River that you might be able to see right over here. So you see the Potomac behind me, you can see it over here, but you have a cool um, here, uh, the Kachanatuk, <laughs> Kachanatig, uh, aqueduct here where you can actually see that the raised canal is going over you know sort of an arm of the Potomac River pretty cool stuff I, I don't really see that anywhere else maybe it happens but I don't know of it anywhere else along the CNO at least as far as I've seen so we're going to talk about the battle of Williamsport a little bit and about Lee's lines here uh, we're talking about you know mid to I'm sorry early to mid July during the retreat at Gettysburg so we're behind Lee's left Lee's right is a place you've also heard of called Falling, wa falling water. So we're gonna talk about that. Let's bring on Chris White and talk about Lee's retreat. All right, um, so thanks everybody. If you haven't checked out our, our videos at Cash Town or at Monterey Pass, please do show, so go back and learn a little bit more about the retreat, but I'll rehash a little bit for you if you haven't seen our other videos. Uh, so what we're seeing now is the retreat from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Gettysburg uh, is up in Pennsylvania. We're down in Maryland now. West Virginia is across the river from where I'm standing. At the time of the Gettysburg campaign, when it started on June 3rd, West Virginia was not a state yet. But by June 20th, midway through the campaign, we now have West Virginia. So we have a new state behind us that the Confederates are trying to retreat into and then eventually get down into Virginia. That will be the idea here. So. What, how do we get here from point A to point B? Again, you can check out our other videos, but very long story short, we're gonna move from Gettysburg in two columns of where the Confederates were moving along through the Cashtown Pass, the Monterey Pass, and we're eventually aiming towards Hagerstown, which is uh, about nine miles from where we're standing, and then down to Williamsport. Down here around Williamsport and at a place called Falling Waters, where if we're Robert E. Lee, we have set up a temporary bridge called a pontoon bridge. A pontoon bridge is simply a temporary bridge put together. Uh, usually it's lashed together with ropes. They have boats that are gonna act as your pylons, so they're just floating. Then you will have runners that go down and then wood planking, it goes across the top. You use rope simply because if the enemy shows up, you can chop those bridges and let them float downstream, take them apart later on. They go back all the, all the way back to the times of ancient Rome as to our aqueducts over here that we're standing beside. So if you ever seen those, those famous aqueducts of Rome, um, you know, you always see them out of the, out of the, the ground and stuff. I'll tell you a, a secret about Rome. Only 10% of their aqueducts were actually out of, out of the ground for you to see. Most of them had a better water system than we do today. Uh, so that's your useless information coming from Europe. Um, 
so now we have these pontoon bridges and we're already late. Now, in our last video, we talked about a lot of moving parts and we're gonna do the same thing here. So let's look at the, at the Union side first because this plays into our, our story. George Gordon Meade and his Army of the Potomac is around Gettysburg. They're gonna start to move to the south, southwest, back into Maryland. A contingent of Cav horsemen are coming in through Pennsylvania and down into Maryland. We'll talk about them in a moment. His infantry is pressing through to Crampton's, Fox's, Turner's Gap. In fact, we crossed Antietam Creek to get here. So we're coming across the old Antietam uh, vicinity of the battlefield. So if you're, if you're familiar with Antietam and you're familiar with South Mountain, we're just down the road. So that's where Meade is gonna start pushing towards. He wants to get down here towards Williamsport. He wants to try to cut off Robert E. Lee if he can or bring him into a battle. Meantime, there are other Union units operating. One up around Harrisburg, one out at Everett, uh, Pennsylvania along Bloody Run, and then one uh, down near Harper's Ferry. That Harper's Ferry contingent uh, under the command of William Blinky French, his nickname's Blinky because he's always blinking, squinting his eyes, playing with his gauntlets. French is gonna dispatch troops down here to Williamsport and destroy Robert E. Lee's lifeline back into what was the Confederacy to him, but West Virginia at the time. So now what he's gonna try to do, Robert E. Lee is gonna try to do, he is now going to try to get in uh, and get more bridges put up. The problem that Robert E. Lee is running into is that it's raining, torrential downpours. It is gonna be thunder, lightning, everything coming down. The roads turn into quagmires. Men are covered with, with mud. But more importantly, the Potomac down here along Watkins Ferry would have been around 13 feet deep at the ferry and four points. He needs it to be about five feet deep. That means Mother Nature has now blocked his passage along with William French taking out his, his um, pontoon bridge to get back into West Virginia, Virginia, down into where he needs to go. So that's what we're, we're starting to look at here if we're Robert E. Lee. Now, the next thing that, that we're gonna have to do is get our wagon trains down here. We fought our way through Monterey Pass. We've gone through Fairfield already, so check out those videos. But now, on July 5th, amazingly, the day after they left Gettysburg, the head of the wagon train is gonna start arriving here into this lowland around Williamsport. Once it starts to arrive here on this lowland, now they know that they have problems. It's raining, they have wagoneers, they have basically what we would call irregular cav down here with us, uh, troopers who are not the best of Jeb Stewart's. Um, so we have a real problem. Now, what are we gonna do? We have Union soldiers coming towards us in the form of two different cavalry divisions under the command of John Buford and Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. So the Confederates have to set up a defensive line down uh, near where we are. Actually, it's gonna be just a little bit uh, to the east of us. They will set up a, a, a defensive line, but they will grab every troop that they can they're gonna have about 2,100 troopers of John, John and Bowden's command. They're all gonna be dismounted. Then you're going to put up about 23 or 24 cannon along a line. Then they're gonna look onto the far side of the river, on this side of the river, get Company F of the 21st Virginia to come over here. They get the 58th uh, North Carolina. They get the 31st Virginia. We start pulling in troops anywhere we can, and we're gonna put up a defensive line. To make matters even worse, we're gonna go to all those Teamsters, those Wagoneers who are coming down here, try to arm them. We're gonna get men out of wagons and try to arm them as well. Wounded soldiers. We'll have men like Alfred Bilo uh, and, and um, John Connolly who were wounded on the first day at Gettysburg having to come out here and fight and hold up a line. So that, that's what's gonna happen because John Buford and his 35 or so hundred troopers will start arriving in Frederick City and then move down modern day Route 40 out towards where we're standing. And he will start to send his troops, Buford will, uh, Wesley Merritt's brigade and William Gamble's brigade. He will dismount those men and start pushing towards the Confederates to try to eventually get down to these lowlands and maybe cut off Lee's forces. Now coming up in support will be Buford's hard hitter, a guy named Tom Devon. At first, you would think that this is John Buford's day to win. And you, and you would be right. The Union forces will push back in what's called the Battle of the Wagoneers. They'll push towards where we're standing. Uh, again, they're fighting just a few miles from where we are. They'll push forward. And then more wagons will show up. But with those wagons will show up Fitzhugh Lee and his brigade of troopers from Lee's army. They will come down and hit Wesley Merritt in the right flank. That'll force Merritt back. That'll force William Gamble back. And this scratch force of Confederates will amazingly and tenaciously hold on 
to save Lee's route of retreat. This has been the story over the last few days. We've had fights at Monterey Pass. We have fights out here now. We're going to have another fight at Hagerstown. Same time, all this is happening. Judson Kilpatrick charges up into Hagerstown about nine miles from where we are. He gets into the city streets. And he's going to talk with a, a young man named Ulrich Dahlgren. You may have heard of the, the Dahlgren raid uh, down in Richmond. That didn't go very well. Um, Ulrich Dahlgren, who had made his way around Lee's army, showed up at a place called Everett, or Bloody Run, attacked the rear of Stewart's column, which is making their way down towards us. We have two columns of troops moving our way down towards us. Captures a bunch of uh, troopers captures a bunch of uh, wagons. Jeb Stewart's just upset about this entire incident. But Dahlgren will eventually find his way down to Hagerstown, where he talks with Judson Kilpatrick. And Kilpatrick, he tells him, let's charge up through the street. And Kilpatrick's not the brightest bulb in the, in the box. He's gonna say, yeah, let's just charge into this town. And they start taking on the 9th and 10th Virginia Cav. As they go into the streets at first, things don't do very well for the Virginians. The first uh, West Virginia, the most highly decorated unit from West Virginia, 14 Medal of Honor recipients in that unit alone will charge into action. The 18th Pennsylvania Cav, uh, the first Vermont Cav, they go charging into the streets and we have melee in the streets of Hagerstown. Finally, some men from Beverly Robertson's Confederate Brigade arrive, more horsemen. Then up will come Alfred Iverson's infantry and stabilize the situation and drive Judson Kilpatrick back from Hagerstown. So it's a lot of tenacious fighting. There are a lot of actions taking place as we come down here towards Williamsport and towards the safety of the Potomac River if we're the Confederates. So now what will happen is that Lee is gonna have to try to get men across the river as quickly as possible. So there was a rope ferry here at the time and there are some fords up and down the river that Lee will utilize. He won't just use two different crossing points. One would have been over here, that would have been our rope ferry at Watkins, and then down the river a little ways, you would have falling water uh, where his bridge was, um, where he could try to get out of here. So now what, what Lee is gonna do is he's gonna come up here to the canal or have his men come to the canal. They're gonna start pulling the canal boats out of here, using them on a rope ferry to go back and forth as quickly as possible. They could take maybe two wagons at a time across the river. They'll also take these, these um, canal boats send them down towards Falling Water, about three miles downstream from us, where they will use those as well as some of the other pontoon bridges that could still be floated and rebuild their pontoon bridge, which took 68 hours to put back together. So think about that. Lee's army stuck for almost three days. It's Mother Nature, it's Meade's army, it's a lot of problems that, that the Confederates seem to be overcoming time and time again. Finally, after 68 hours, they get that bridge put up. They're even using anchors which just rocks uh, in boxes thrown over the side of their pontoon bridges to keep them in place. And the river is gonna start to finally start to settle down, go from a 13 foot stage down to about five feet at the fords. And now Robert E. Lee, in the meantime, had set up a defense on a place called Salisbury Ridge. Salisbury Ridge, you can't see it from where we're standing. It's off in the distance a little ways uh, from where we're standing, a few miles from where we are. He has set up a defensive line on the left side, he's put Richard Yule, his center, A.P. Hill, and on his right, James Longstreet. He's fortified this position. It's a very impressive position. When George Gordon Meade finally makes it into the Hagerstown, Williamsport area, he will send probing units out in front to take a look. He'll send men of the Signal Corps up into high steeples and houses and overlook this land, and then he'll call a council of war, his third one in about three days, asking what his subordinates think. He will deploy his army with the, with the 11th Corps on the right flank, because clearly no one has learned anything about putting the, right, the 11th Corps on the right flank. And he is going to extend the 1st, the 6th, and then all the way down to the 5th, the 2nd. He will bring everyone online. He will bring his entire, his entire army online. And he will meet with his commanders, and only two of them. Oliver Otis Howard, his 11th Corps commander, and James Wadsworth, the division commander in 1st Corps, will say, let's attack. Howard has to make up for two very poor battles that his men have fought in. So he's kind of, you know, put off to the side. Wadsworth is a politician. He doesn't know much better, but almost every one of his commanders have sat there and said, let's not attack these works. They're so formidable. Charles Wainwright, uh, a first Corps artillerist who's in charge of the Union first Corps artillery, will talk about the works being so formidable. And he also talks about Meade being in a very unenviable position. He won the battle of Gettysburg. Now coming down here to Williams, uh, Williams uh, Port, 
if he attacks at Williamsport, he is going to have a big problem on his hands. Because if he attacks and Meade is defeated, now the Northern press is gonna start asking for his head. If he doesn't attack, the press will, will ask for his head. Decides eventually not to attack here uh, along the banks of the Potomac River, along the CNO Canal, uh, over along what's called Salisbury Ridge. So now here at, at Williamsport, which I may have been calling Williamsburg for a while, I'm not sure in this video. <laughs> I don't think so. It's all inter interchangeable in my mind. We, uh, along Williamsport, <coughs> bless you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, he is you know, now faced with this situation. So, so we have Lee, who his back is literally against the river. He has only two escape routes right here behind us, near where the, the modern bridge is, because this, this part of the river actually creates a, a bowl, as it were, that juts, or a salient, that juts outward in that direction. And then, of course, he has his escape route at Falling Water. So this has been the, the story of the Gettysburg campaign, or at least the retreat of it for Lee. Two roads to get him back to safety. And time and again, the Union forces have failed to take those roads. There'll be another battle down at a place called Falling Waters. By the time that pl takes place on July the 14th, almost all of Lee's army's out of here. Lee will again, very skillfully pull James Longstreet's corps offline. He'll pull Richard Ewell's corps offline. He will send Jeb Stewart, who is out in front trying to screen to buy time. He'll start pulling them back. And eventually at Falling Waters, you will see Henry Heath's division, the man who opened up the battle by surprise on July 1st, be surprised again at Falling Waters. And he'll lose one of his uh, subordinate officers, Johnston Pettigrew, who Lee, after the battle of Gettysburg and after this campaign ends, almost blames Pettigrew for not taking Gettysburg and not driving John Buford out on June the 30th. Robert E. Lee's playing a little back uh, a backseat generaling here after the fact. And there's a little bit of controversy. Some people will say, that Pettigrew had orders not to bring on an engagement on June 30th. Those wouldn't have come, those orders wouldn't have come from Lee. They would have come from Henry Heath or A.P. Hill. Others, like Henry Heath, who's trying to save his bacon for being jumped twice or surprised twice during this campaign, will later tell the Southern Historical Society, no, 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 he could have went in there and he could have attacked. But, you know, there's a lot of what if, what could, should have, would have after the battle or after the fact. Uh, but the fact remains that Johnson Pettigrew is wounded in this action at Falling Waters, where the 6th Michigan Cav makes a, makes a charge, a guy named Peter Weber. It'll cost Weber his life, but Meade's army will find out that most of Lee's army is gone. Heath's men will fall back pell-mell on Dorsey Pender's division. Pender only has a few days left to live, um, I think at this point, if I have my timetable correct. And uh, James Lane's in charge of his division. They'll bolster the line push back Judson Kilpatrick Cav one more time and then the rest of the army will slip away across the Potomac River and end the Gettysburg campaign, the costliest campaign of the American Civil War. And it all happened here on the banks of the Potomac River where most people wouldn't even think that there was a battle uh, not too far from where we're standing, battle in the streets of Hagerstown, battle at Monterey Pass. And this is a, a great indication if you have a chance, follow the Civil War trail signs Go see our friends at Civil War Trails and follow their trail all the way from Gettysburg. You could actually follow it up to Gettysburg, but down here to Williamsport and onto the Potomac River. So that is how the Gettysburg campaign will end. And I'm going to do a quick flip with Gary to see what Gary has to say. For once, I think I'll have rather little to say. Let's see if I can get it done in less than a minute. First of all, some of those Civil War trail signs are right behind me. You can see where the bikes are. It's just great, by the way. People use this CNO Canal for exercise primarily, but they get a little history along the way, especially when they come to our Civil War places, when they go through Harper's Ferry. They're always going to learn a little bit more. And I hope you'll check out the uh, uh, CNO Canal while you're following the Civil War Trail or otherwise. Y'all, I just want to thank you for coming along on yet another trip with us as we go to Gettysburg, at Gettysburg, around Gettysburg. And and then in this case, this year, finally, the retreat from Gettysburg. If you want a little bit more of this, you know, maybe read Kent Masterson's Brown, Brown's book on the retreat at Gettysburg. There's some good emerging Civil War books um, about it. And there's, of course, some videos and other things you can watch about it. There's a lot more to learn. It's a fascinating part of the study. I like Edwin B. Coddington's treatment of it as well at the end of his 
masterful Gettysburg is study in command. So for all y'all that have come along, shared the videos, share them with your friends. It's not too late. More people can see them. Hop over to our YouTube channel. You'll see some things you didn't see um, on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, hop over to Facebook. You'll see some things you didn't see along the way as well. Thanks, Chris, for everything. Thanks to all of our guests. And thank you all for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.